Well, please turn to me in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. Ecclesiastes 1, 8 through 11. Ecclesiastes, which is a Greek translation of that Hebrew word for preacher, was written by the preacher, verse 1, also known as Koheleth, the Hebrew word for preacher, also known as King Solomon. Why was this written? It's written to warn God's people to not go down the road that Solomon went down. See, Solomon's giving the people God's wisdom so that they don't waste their lives away on the things that don't matter and on the things that lead to hell. So Ecclesiastes is Solomon's account of what he had learned from his futile attempt to live without God. And he wants to help those who are coming behind him, even us today, to learn from his very costly and sinful mistakes. Don't do it, he's saying. Don't do what I did. I'm warning you. Don't go down that road. Remember what happened? It's an incredibly sad story. It started out well. I mean, King Solomon began his reign as a humble servant of the Lord, desperately seeking God's wisdom and desperately seeking God's help. When he ascended to the throne, he sought after God, and God gave him the opportunity to ask for whatever he wanted, anything whatsoever, anything at all. So what then did he ask for? He humbly acknowledged his inability to rule the people. So he asked God for the wisdom that he would need to rule God's people justly. And God graciously gave him that wisdom. And look, God also gave him incredible wealth. Okay, so what happened to him? 1 Kings 11.4 tells us, As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. So while Solomon knew what was right, he didn't apply that wisdom to himself. How does that happen? It happens one sin at a time. He unwisely let sin sneak in. Many wives who didn't serve nor love the Lord, it then affected his heart and it affected his mind as it always does, and it led him down a road of incredible folly. Solomon actually had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and this all obviously greatly displeased the Lord, and it was clearly against the law of God, but Solomon didn't care, and so they turned his heart away. Ecclesiastes records what it was like for him during that time that he had turned away from the Lord. All right, Solomon, what was it like? Vanity of vanities, everything is vanity without the Lord. That's what it's like. Solomon made that all very clear in the first few verses of chapter 1. Let's continue to find out what he learned, and we'll begin at verse 8, because I want to look at that verse just a little bit more today. Verse 8. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express that the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new? It's already been in ancient times before us. There's no remembrance of former things, nor will be, there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. So here, Solomon notes three truths, the first being this, again, which we looked at a little bit last time, this, that all things are full of labor. Anybody agree with that? <laughs> labor means weary, tired, and feeble. The sense here is this, that the weariness of all things exceeds human ability to even explain it. One translation says, all of life is far more boring than words could ever say. Another translation says it this way, all things fatigue. All things are full of burdens and troubles. And that really is a summary of what Solomon's been saying in the first part of this chapter, that everything under the sun is laborious, and that nothing in this life apart from the Lord can bring true satisfaction. Men seek and they find, and yet they toil again, no nearer the prize than at the beginning. Now remember, the phrase under the sun is used 29 times in Ecclesiastes, and it defines Solomon's outlook as he looks at life from a human perspective only, not from a Christian perspective perspective, not from a true believer's perspective, no, but from a human perspective alone. And look, as Solomon looks at things merely from a worldly perspective under the sun and apart from God, 
It's all very bleak to him. I mean, rightly so. Rightly so. I mean, when people only consider life under the sun, and when they never really look at life over the sun to God, then everything really is vanity. Solomon made that point very clear. Remember that? He said just by way of review that generations come and go. See, time flies. One generation may be rising, but at the same time, another generation is dying off. Round and round and round and round. Time marches on and then you die. And so it's all very futile and bleak apart from the Lord. He continued to make his point in the first few verses of chapter 1 by saying that the sun rises and falls and it illustrates the monotony and the pointlessness of life under the sun. Around and around and around the sun goes without ever actually ending up anywhere. Like life. Day after day after day, the sun rises and sets and and rises again for centuries on end, over and over and over again. A merry-go-round, repetitive monotony, day by day by day by day, blah, 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 like life under the sun. The wind also proves this point that the wind is constantly moving and changing directions, yet it's still the wind. And look, it never reaches its destination. It just keeps blowing and blowing and blowing. So for all its constant movement, there's never any real progress. And again, that's what life without the Lord and under the sun is like. Constant, repetitive motion without any real progress. And then we die, and it's over. But the wind is still there. The wind is still blowing. How futile, how frustrating, how sad. The waters of the earth also illustrate this point, how Even the flow of water just seems profitless. I mean, it's all just an endless cycle. Solomon says that the sea is like a bottomless pit that never is satisfied. And even though all the rivers run into the sea, the sea is never filled. Oh, the monotony of all of it. Water evaporation, clouds rain. Water evaporation, clouds rain. On and on and on it goes. It's again a big merry-go-round. What's the real point of it? What's the real point? And this is where you end up if you look at life under the sun. This is where you end up if you leave God out of the picture. So Solomon says in verse 8, all things are full of labor. Man can't express it. In other words, everything under the sun is wearisome. And nothing is really ever completed to man's true, true satisfaction. It's just boring. Mundane, empty, purposeless. What's the point of it all? Soon we're all going to be dust. We're all going to die. And then what? See, it's a good point. It's a good point. Solomon tried to figure out a satisfying solution to this apart from the Lord. And guess what? Apart from the Lord, he never found it. Why not? I mean, think about it. Money, fame, power, sex, pleasure, Other people, houses, earthly goods, traveling the world, a good job, alcohol, drugs. Solomon, help us out with this. I can't. It's all vanity. Apart from the Lord, it's nothing. Empty. Meaningless. All of it. Because only God can fill the void. Only God can give true meaning. Look what he says The eye is not satisfied with seeing. And that is true. Look, our sense of sight is responsible for most of the information that we absorb from our five senses. Generally speaking, people hold their eyesight above the other senses. In one study, 88 participants ranked vision as their most valued sense. Now think about it. A newborn baby opens its eyes that very first time and it begins to see all these wonders And those wonders continue to be seen throughout life. Oh, look at that. Did you see that? Show me that. I want to see that. We're always taking in new things by way of our eyes every single day. But even then, we want to see more. True? I want to. What's the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? You open your eyes, right? But look, what you see brings no permanent satisfaction. Not really. One said, 
Men cry for more of the world, but when it comes, it doesn't satisfy. Not really. Not really. Like the ocean, our senses are fed and fed and fed and fed, but they're never truly filled. I remember seeing the Grand Canyon for the first time. Man, seeing the Grand Canyon for the first time was absolutely incredible. But guess what? I want to go back and see it again. More. I saw the Colosseum in Rome last year. It was amazing. Guess what I want to do? I want to go back and see it again. I forget. See, I want to take more of it in. I want to see more. I can't get enough of the mountains, the ocean, the stars, the incredible beauty of planet Earth. I want to see more. But here's the thing. What we see can never satisfy the emptiness that we have in our hearts that only God can fill. That's a fact. What we see can't give any of us true and lasting purpose. What we see will never, ever bring true satisfaction, not really, again, because only God can do that. A while back, an old man who refused to surrender the, to the Lord died. He saw many great sights in his lifetime all around the world, but that didn't help him out on his deathbed. While he lay sick, he refused to talk to anyone about his relationship with the Lord and about his eternal fate. Shortly before he died, he suddenly sat up in bed screaming, the devils are come! The devils are come! Keep them off of me! After that, he blacked out. Just before he died, he seemed to summon all of his strength, rose up in his bed, and he shouted, hell and damnation! Hell and damnation! And I quote, he fell back, choked, strangled, and died. See, seeing great things throughout his life didn't help him in his greatest time of need. It didn't help him at all. Seeing great things throughout your life won't help you with your eternal burden, with your guilt of sin, with your desperate need for forgiveness, rescue, and deliverance from hell. Won't help you at all. Not even close. Another firsthand testimony regarding a Mrs. Jones says this, I got to know Mrs. Jones in the winter of 1866. She had traveled the world and she would talk about all the amazing things that she had seen throughout her life. I'd often urged her to surrender to Christ in repentant faith while she was in good health, but she always refused. I called to see her during her last sickness and I found her in a most distressing state of mind. She recognized me when I came in and she was screaming out, devils are in my room ready to drag my soul down to hell. She kept affirming that she could see devils all around her. She would say, oh, see them laugh at me. This would then throw her into a fit of fear and dread, causing her to scream out on her bed. But when I tried to get her to look to Jesus for help, she said, it's no use. It's too late. Now that's wrong, right? It's never too late, not while we still have breath. That is wrong. But look, she died in great distress, refusing to surrender to the Lord. Again, seeing great things throughout your life means nothing. Nothing. If you live only under the sun and without Christ as Savior and Lord. And on your deathbed, who cares how many sights you have seen? Will what you have seen save your soul from hell? No. Will what you have seen get you into heaven and give you true eternal satisfaction? Not even close. Again, only Jesus can do that. But look, not only is the eye not satisfied with seeing, but the ear isn't satisfied with hearing. My poor father has a hard time hearing, and it's a miserable thing for him to have to endure. Why? Because there's always conversations to be heard. There's always people to communicate with and music, wonderful music to listen to and sounds to enjoy, and we can't get enough. But even that doesn't give us true satisfaction. Not really. I remember a couple decades ago or more when a new song would come out on the radio that would catch my attention. Wow, I would say, what a great song. I need to hear that again. So what would I have to do? I would drive around in my car listening to the radio so that I could hear that song again. Old people, anybody. <laughs> Eventually, I would get the name of the song I would go to the record store and buy a record, and then as technology really, truly progressed, I'd buy a tape just so I could listen to that one song. What would I do? 
I'd play that song over and over and over and over again. And soon that awesome song wasn't so awesome anymore. Soon I wore that song out and I'll do the same thing to another song. As one noted, the ear is fond at first of a pleasant song or tune, but soon nauseates it. And it must have another. He's right. We always want more. More conversations, more to take in. More to listen to, new songs, new sounds, more, 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 more. And here's the verdict. Seeing and hearing be, brings no true, true satisfaction, not really. So even while people are speaking and seeing and hearing, and even though there's always more things to see and to hear, look, in the end, it's all just very empty. In the end, it's all just extremely unsatisfying. Next! What's next? It's all a sign of humanity's emptiness. See, people who live only under the sun are busy taking in all kinds of sights and all kinds of sounds, trying to distract themselves from the emptiness. Kind of like trying to walk up an infinite sand hill. Busy, 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 because I certainly don't want to think about the vanity of it all. I certainly don't want to really think about how miserable I, I truly am. Bring on the sand hill. <laughs> but that's not going to solve the problem, see. The emptiness still remains if you only live under the sun. One note of this. Our hearts go forth towards a multiplicity of objects, and instead of desiring and laying hold of God alone, who would have been an eternally satisfying portion, we long for and grasp at thousands of created objects and we still never realize true contentment. That's absolutely right. That's most of humanity because they only live under the sun and apart from God. In Ecclesiastes 3.11, Solomon explains why men and women aren't satisfied with life under the sun. Here's why. He says, because God has put eternity in their heart and so nobody can find true peace and true satisfaction apart from the Lord. Instead, emptiness. A whole vanity. Augustine said, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. As Jesus said, Come unto me, and I will give you rest, true satisfaction, eternal meaning. Until then, until that happens, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It's all meaningless, it's all empty, it's just a vapor, a wisp, and then it's gone. The second truth to note is this, that there is nothing new under the sun. Verse 9, that which has been is what will be, and that which is done is what will be done, and there's nothing new under the sun. In other words, despite all man's work and all man's progress, life seems monotonously the same. Things that seem new, they get old very quickly, and the more that things change, the more they stay the same. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Note that this phrase, there's nothing new under the sun, is a sweeping comment of the human scene. And it's not a pronouncement about new inventions. See, Solomon's words here aren't contradicted by technological advances or by the fact that we can, can indeed remember the names of some famous people throughout history. No, here's the real point of what he's saying. That the fundamental events of life, birth, marriage, work, death, and so on, those things remain unchanged. Cars, computers, and airplanes may have made some things easier and faster. The new iPhone, artificial intelligence, the cyber truck, all very interesting and even a bit scary. Anybody? <laughs> However, guess what? The sun still rises and falls. Uh, the rivers run their course. People continue their endless quest for fame, power, and happiness, even as they move steadily towards death. And even so, the vast majority of people never achieve lasting fame. And those that do, they gain nothing by it. Same old, same old. It's the same old thing. Alexander McLaren said, What's the difference between a squirrel in a cage who only makes his prison go round the faster by his swift race and the man who lives toilsome days for transitory objects which he may never attain? See, people are the same at heart. The earth is the same. And Solomon knows that deep down, nothing is really changed on that front. As Marcus Aurelius wrote, they that come after us will see nothing new. 
And they who went before us saw nothing more than what we have seen. And he's right. And those who think that they have seen something new are those who have a very limited experience and they often mistake novelty for originality. Even so, Solomon is fundamentally correct. Nations rise and fall, but human nature remains the same. Who of us, think about this, who of us can't relate to Adam and Eve? Who of us can't relate to Job, to David in the Psalms, to Jacob, to Peter? See, deep down, things really are the same. There's nothing new under the sun. Solomon continues to prove his point by regarding those who only live under the sun by saying, that which has been is what will be. In other words, same old thing. What's happened in the past is what will happen again. Verse 10, is there anything of which may be said, see, this is new? It's already been in ancient times before us. Again, the point is clear that while progress is made in technology and, and new inventions, humanity at its core remains the same and then you die. People still have the same fallen nature as ever. They still have the same basic problems, the same moral deficiencies, and the same underlying insecurities that people have always had. That explains why history doesn't really seem to be going anywhere like a wheel on a hamster cage. Because what we see now is what people have seen before, and it's what people will see again. So the point is crystal clear. If you live apart from God, it's all vanity. It's just an endless circle until you die. Solomon continues and says this, that which is done is what will be done. Again, he's just making the same point. He's just making sure that he drives the point home. Nothing really changes at its core level. Humanity labors under a continual case of cultural and historical amnesia. Monotony, time flies. No real satisfaction, and then death. And it all continues to happen for centuries. So what are we to do about the tick and the talk of time over our heads and about the trap door of death beneath our feet? Well, apart from the Lord, people deal with this in three ways. Escapism, nihilism, and hedonism. First, escapism. I'm just going to ignore it all. I'm just going to ignore it all. I'm not going to delve too deeply into things like Solomon does here. I don't want to do that. I'll just (laughs) live my life and watch the game and go to work and play with the kids and love my spouse and take a family vacation and then watch the game and watch the game and watch the game. Escapism. This is most people who live life under the sun and apart from God. But here's a question. What are you going to do in the end? I went on a psychology website. Are you ready for this? The writer gave some insight as to how to find meaning in your life under the sun wisdom here. Okay, you ready for this under the sun wisdom? She says, you're using the wrong measuring stick. Meaning is simply a sense of significance. So here's a pocket-sized definition of meaning. Meaning. If you've been of service to even one other living creature at any point in your life, then you have achieved a meaningful life. Okay. (laughs) She says, that time you were patient with the stressed out grocery store clerk when you avoided stepping on that ladybug? Meaningful life. It doesn't matter if it was small, we're all small, and perhaps your meaning is to simply be here, to be a part of the natural world, just like the trees and the animals. Maybe it matters that you're here simply because you're here. Okay. (laughs) Maybe you're reassessing your life because you've achieved your goals and you still feel empty. Maybe your original goal was taken from you. A lost career, a health crisis, a financial calamity. You face the painful reality that your original life's goal can lead only to meaningless. Now, dear friend, it's time to pursue a new meaning. Here's one tip. Dream small. Okay. Even if you don't particularly enjoy people or don't have a community available, you can still play a meaningful role in the world around you. Familiarize yourself and cultivate connections with living things, even plants and animals. Maybe you be a caretaker of a lovely garden. Perhaps you'll become a rescuer of stray cats. 
Maybe your life's purpose is to run a garden full of well-fed stray cats, oxygen-producing plants, and native bees. You get to pick. Meaningful life. It goes on. <laughs> Let's assume the worst case scenario. All of our lives are meaningless. Does that have to be a bad thing? Yes! Does an insignificant life mean that it's not worth living? I invite you to radically challenge your assumptions about a life worth living. Humans are surrounded by an ecosystem teeming with life. Not just plants and animals, but minuscule fungi and microorganisms. Too small to see with the naked eye. They're living in your body and on your skin. You yourself are an ecosystem. I don't like this. <laughs> Layered with millions of lives of which you have no conscious awareness. Perhaps this is all meaningless, simply an explosion of biochemistry. But is it not also beautiful? Maybe it's time to unlearn your negative assumptions of meaninglessness. Put down your expectations for what you should be. Lean into our tiny, lovely slice of the universe's chaos. Really? That's the answer. That's the best you've got. Really. In other words, ignore it all. Try to cover the emptiness by not squashing a ladybug. Try to fill the vanity of your fast life by tending to your garden. Do the best to not think too deeply about the fact that soon you're going to be dead. And then what? It's still all very empty. I'm still not truly satisfied because guess what? Tending my garden can't really satisfy my empty soul. See? Trying to escape that reality isn't going to help either. Second is nihilism. Nihilism teaches that life has no objective meaning or intrinsic value. You just have to deal with it. Leo Tolstoy was a nihilist who considered his life to be a meaningless, regrettable failure. He wrote, my question, that which at the age of 50 brought me to the verge of suicide, was the simplest of questions lying in the soul of every man, a question without an answer to which one cannot live. It was this, what will come of what I'm doing today and tomorrow? What will come of my life as a whole? Why should I live? Why wish for anything? And why do anything under the sun? See? It's a good thought. One nihilist philosopher wrote this in a novel entitled Nausea. He said this. It was true. I, would al I had always realized it. I hadn't any right to exist at all. I had appeared by chance. I existed like a stone, a plant, a microbe. I could feel nothing to myself but an inconsequential buzzing. I was thinking that here we are eating and drinking to preserve our precious existence and that there's nothing, nothing, absolutely no reason for existing. So what do I do? I just deal with it. I just deal with it. How sad. And what a lie. Third, hedonism. Where people live for pleasure as their ultimate pursuit. Their slogan is this, let's eat, drink, because tomorrow we die. And that's most people today. Enjoy life. You only live once, so live it up while you can. But how has this view fared for most of the people in Hollywood? I mean, you look at the Hollywood stars and you see all the, this obsession with themselves. Bigger houses, more shoes, bigger diamonds, the best cars, more money, the best clothes and by the best designers. And I've never seen so many people so incredibly miserable. See, hedonism is, a, is an empty pursuit that only brings fading pleasure that doesn't and cannot last. I read about a woman on a ship that was sinking. As the ship was going down, this woman saw a heap of gold coins scattered on the cabin floor by those who had thrown it there in the confusion of the escape. So she gathered up as much as she could. She put it in a bag. She wrapped the bag around her waist and she dove into the water. What happened to her? She sank like a stone. And that's what hedonism does. In the end, under the sun, it's just all empty. It's all just meaningless. Charles Bridges noted, humanity is as far as ever from true rest and satisfaction. Our disappointed forefathers in bygone days didn't find it, and we shall find the world as they did. So we shall leave it to our children, a world of vexation, a shadow, 
and a bubble. Poof. Gone. Vanity. Empty. Happy? Third, there will be no remembrance of former things, verse 11. There's no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. Anybody depressed? So is life apart from God. See, we're looking at life apart from God. It's all very depressing. Good. We should be depressed. Anybody grateful for Jesus at this point? (laughs) Right? Come on. This book should cause us to love him all the more because without him, it's all very, very incredibly dark and bleak. Here Solomon's making it clear that the futility of life seems to extend in both directions, both into the past and on into the future. Man works hard, yet it never seems to make a lasting difference. And in the end, it's all just simply forgotten. Look, not far from now, what we've accumulated will be lost and what we have accomplished will be forgotten. And that's absolutely true. Our descendants won't remember us any better than we remember our ancestors. Poof, it's just gone. It's true. We are one of billions of souls now living on planet Earth, and soon all of us will be gone, and another generation will come and go, and then another, and then another, and time marches on, and we are forgotten. Yes, we can write a book. Some may even... uh, have a street named after them or a a monument, but no one's going to read the book. People will forget why the street has that weird name and the monument will get torn down and this is just the way it is and Solomon knows that. See, time blots out a multitude of events as if they had never been. Here's a fact. You're going to die and you're going to be forgotten. (laughs) You're welcome. It's Solomon, not me. It's true. You're going to die and you're going to be forgotten. Maybe not right away as your memory will be discussed at the dinner table of your children or of your grandchildren. But down the line, no remembrance. This is the reality of life under the sun. See, apart from God, the world is poor, poor, poor. The world's all title page without contents. The world's comforts are withering. They stop this side of the grave, and all is dark beyond apart from Christ. Thus all the idols and heroes of the world, the mighty and the celebrated, with all their titles and and all their grandeur, they pass by and they're forgotten. Dust. Gone. One said, a miserable fool indeed is he who has no better stay and portion than this shadowy remembrance. So, we'll be forgotten, and those who come after us, will also be covered with the same veil of death and oblivion. The things of this life that now hold our attention, they'll all gradually pass away as time marches on. See, our time is limited, and soon it's forever gone. And all we can do is improve the little that remains, and we don't know how much time we have left. Look, if you saw a man standing by the shore flinging gold coins and diamonds into the sea, you'd say that that man was insane. But this is what people do all the time, not with gold and not with precious stones, but with minutes, hours, days, weeks, and years of time, which is indeed of much greater worth than any coin or any stone. One said, time is a strange commodity. We can't save it, retrieve it, relive it, stretch it, borrow it, loan it, stop it, or store it. We can only use it or lose it. In Psalm 90, Moses laments the brevity of life. He compares life to the grass of the field that sprouts in the morning and by evening it's faded under the hot sun. He writes in verse 10, As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow, for soon it's gone and we fly away. He's right. And even if you live to be 100, how quickly life flies by and then we are gone and then we are forgotten and then it's over. So here's a question. If our life is just a tiny little blip on on the screen of eternity, and it is, and if we will be forgotten in the generations that come, and we will, then what does it all really matter? Especially if it's all just vanity, meaningless, a chasing 
after the wind and brings no true and lasting fulfillment and satisfaction, which is true if you only live under the sun? Here's the answer. Live life over the sun. That is the answer. See, you don't have to remain. Here's the good news. We're finally there. You don't have to remain in the empty, mundane vanity of life that flies by under the sun. No, you don't. But instead, you can indeed live over the sun. And the mundane, boring, empty, blah, blah, blah life under the sun can be filled with meaning, purpose, hope, and joy in Christ and only in Christ. See, there's nothing new under the sun. But guess what? God can make things new. Yes, he can. God can do it. God can make sinners new creatures when they trust Jesus Christ to save them. They can walk in newness of life. They can sing a new song. They can enter into God's presence by a new and living way. And then one day, they will enjoy a new heaven and a new earth where God says, Behold, I make all things new. God can do it. So while there is nothing new under the sun, guess what? God can make you new. God can give you true purpose and eternal meaning. God can satisfy that which nothing else can. God can give you hope, joy, purpose, and peace, meaning, forgiveness, and eternal life by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. It doesn't have to be all vanity for you, not with Christ. See, And that's, that's what Solomon's going to get to eventually. He looked forward to Christ. We look back at Christ. It's all about Christ. He's the one who gives true purpose and fills the emptiness. He's the only one who can. See, he came. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross and he rose up three days later from the dead. And the good news is that for everyone who believes in Christ in repentant faith, you will be saved from the wages of sin and you will go to heaven instead of hell because of Christ. Because He paid the wages of sin for every believer on the cross so that we who believe could be rescued from those wages and go to heaven forever. And it means absolutely everything. See, there's hope. All is not vanity when you live life over the Son in Christ. What about you? Look, this life is not our final existence. We were made for a better world. The very fact that we are weary of life is pointing us to the only God who can truly satisfy our souls. In Psalm 119, 57, the writer says these wonderful words. He says, Lord, you are my portion. What does that mean? That God is sufficient for every one of our true needs. That he satisfies and if you have him you have enough and there's nothing lacking whatsoever if you have him so with him all is not vanity bubbles emptiness a merry-go-round not at all one said he is an eternal full satisfactory portion he is an ever-living ever-loving ever-present friend and without him you are a cursed creature in every condition and all things will work against you that's true but if you have him, he's all you need. He's all you need. Friends may leave you, but if you have the Lord, you have enough. You may lose all your earthly goods, but if you have the Lord, you have enough. You may be faced with wants and needs and trials and fears and troubles and tears, but if God is for us, then who can really be against us? See, he is enough. You may face death, but if you have the Lord, you have enough to see you through it all the way to the end, to glory, to heaven forever. So with God as your portion, what else really matters? See, note this. That while there is no remembrance of us as we live under the sun, here's some good news. For those who live over the sun, for those who know and love Christ as Savior and Lord, look, how we live here truly does matter, and it does indeed last for all eternity. Because God sees, and God knows, and God rewards fruit and faithfulness. And what we in Christ do for God and for His glory as children, as His children, 
That has eternal value and that will indeed reap eternal reward. Life truly matters with Christ. What you do for Christ and for his glory truly matters. So here's some advice. Live life over the sun. Live over this in Christ and find true meaning and satisfaction that will never end in Christ. Jesus, see, is the end of our quest for true satisfaction. There's nothing beyond and there's nothing better. Christ alone. Christ alone. He's your answer. He's your only answer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us, O oh Lord, <clears throat> to understand these very important truths from Solomon. Help us, Lord, to learn from his massive mistakes and to not go down the road that he went down. But Lord, may we look to you. May we cling to you. May we live over the sun and for your glory. May we all understand right here, right now that all is not meaningless without you. Everything is not vanity when we have you. Speak to our hearts. May we draw closer to you and may we love you with more fervor today in light of these truths. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.